Well, hey guys, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Dr. Dre, I'm a board certified dermatologist, and in this video, we're getting into a hot topic. Do medications like Ozempic and Wagovi cause hair loss? With the rise in GLP-1 receptor agonist medications for diabetes and weight loss, an increasing number of patients are finding themselves asking the question, why is my hair shedding so much? Why am I losing so much hair ever since going on these medications? In this video, I'm gonna break down what the science says, what we know so far, and what you can do if you're experiencing hair loss while undergoing these treatments. So first of all, what are GLP-1 receptor agonist medications? These are a class of medications originally developed to treat type 2 diabetes, but now they're widely used for weight loss as well. You've probably heard of many of these, Wagovi, Ozempic, Trulicity, Manjaro. These medications work by mimicking a natural hormone that your body produces called GLP-1. This hormone works to regulate insulin, digestion, and appetite. The results? people can lose quite a bit of weight, sometimes 10% or more of their body mass. But with that amount of weight loss, you can experience in some cases, some side effects that you might not be expecting, such as, as it's relevant to today's video, an increase in the amount of hair loss. As a board certified dermatologist, if I can leave you with one piece of hair loss information to take away from this channel, I don't care if you're on these medications or not, not all hair loss is the same. There are so many types of hair loss out there each with its own specific root cause, each with its own specific treatment approach. Knowing the type of hair loss you have is key to figuring out how to correct it. But for the purposes of today's video, think of hair loss in two main buckets, scarring and non-scarring. As it relates to these medications, we're gonna be focusing on the two main types of non-scarring hair loss, androgenetic alopecia and telogen effluvium. Telogen effluvium, what is that? Telogen effluvium refers to a type of hair loss where you suddenly have an increase and hair shedding. It's normal to lose around 100 to 200 hairs per day. However, in the setting of telogen effluvium, all of a sudden you are losing a lot more hairs every single day, coming out in clumps. Very distressing, not to mention taxing on the shower drain. This is often caused by a major stressor, an illness, surgery, changes in medications, underlying medical illness, and in many cases, significant weight loss. Then you have androgenetic alopecia, arguably the most common type of hair loss out there. It affects both men and women. It's called androgenetic because it's influenced by both your genetics, meaning you inherit a tendency to have it, as well as the underlying androgen hormones. In this condition, the androgen hormones affect the hair follicle. It's very sensitive to those hormones for whatever reason, likely again related to your genetics, and the androgen hormones cause the follicle to miniaturize, to turn into a little tiny baby vellus hair. This is commonly referred to as pattern hair loss. Androgenetic alopecia in contrast to telogen of Fluvium is chronic and it's influenced by your genetics, meaning you were born with a tendency to have it. Telogen effluvium is like a situational situation. While both are non-scarring, meaning the hair follicle is not destroyed by the hair loss process, it can come back, so to speak. They are not the same. They differ not only in, of course, the root cause, but also how to go about correcting them. But the big question here that we're addressing in today's video is do GLP-1 medications cause these types of hair loss? Or is it really just unmasking an underlying hair loss condition? We can sit here and speculate until the cows come home, but what does the actual science show? What do the data reveal when we go in and study patients taking these medications? Well, a large retrospective study that looked at 1 million patients compared those who took GLP-1 medications with those who didn't. Researchers specifically excluded in the study people who had underlying hair loss issues like related to their thyroid, for example, menopause, or a recent surgery. Here's what the data revealed. At six months, people on a GLP-1 receptor agonist medication had a 26% higher odds of having a non-scarring hair loss. They had a 62% higher odds of having pattern hair loss, aka androgenetic alopecia. Also at the six month mark, they had a slightly increased risk of having telogen effluvium, excessive hair shedding. When they looked at 12 months, however, the risk seemed more pronounced. There was a 76% increase increased odds in telogen effluvium, a 64% increased odds in pattern hair loss, androgenetic alopecia, and a 40% increased odds overall of having non-scarring hair loss. Importantly, there was no increase in other non-scarring hair losses such as autoimmune hair loss, like alopecia areata. So what exactly is going on here? Well, there are a few theories. First of all, the most likely explanation is that it's not a direct effect of the medication itself, meaning the medication is not 
not poisoning the hair or causing hair loss as a side effect, but rather it's a side effect of the weight loss and perhaps the stress on the body of losing that much weight. Keep in mind, with regards to telogen effluvium, excessive hair shedding, when the body undergoes a significant change, whether it be metabolic, whether it be weight loss, any, any major change can trigger excessive hair shedding. Think about it. Think about it. If you weren't aware, growing a hair is very energy intense. It's very energy demanding. It's not necessary, however, to sustain your life. So in those scenarios, your body adjusts and it says, all right, let's not prioritize this hair growth process. Instead, we're going to divert our attention elsewhere because things are looking like they could get a little shaky. So the hairs shift around in the growing cycle. They shift to the resting phase and then they shed. One thing about this is it doesn't happen on the day you start taking the medication. It doesn't start on the day you begin to drop weight and see that number fall on the scale. It usually starts around three months after the change has happened. So it can take a while for it to start showing up. What about the androgenetic alopecia story? Well, in some cases, the rapid weight loss combined with the increase in hair shedding in the case of telogen effluvium can actually unmask an underlying androgenetic alopecia. Again, androgenetic alopecia is something that you are born with a tendency to develop. So it's kind of brewing and kind of lingering there all along. All of a sudden, when you have an increased number of hairs falling out, coming out in clumps, well, that miniaturization is a lot more obvious. For example, in women, you see a widening of the central part, you get receding hairline. Think about it. If you had a lot more hair in the growing phase overlying that, once all of that hair sheds acutely, it's like, wow, I can see a lot more scalp than ever before. Very distressing. Okay, let's just take a moment to appreciate how distressing this is to have your hair coming out. Okay, it is psychologically something else. All right, so people have nightmares about this kind of thing. I empathize with people struggling with hair loss. It's very distressing, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. We don't have strong evidence that the GLP-1 medication itself is harmful to the hair follicle or causing any kind of permanent alteration to the ability to grow healthy hair. What does this mean for you if you are on these medications and beginning to notice hair loss, hair shedding? First of all, you're not alone. It's common and for the most part, some degree of this is to be expected. If you had lost a significant amount of weight from weight loss surgery through diet and exercise, you could expect to experience this exact same thing. Second thing to keep in mind with regards to telogen effluvium, for the most part, it is a temporary situation. It is a temporary thing, meaning you will not have this profound excessive hair shedding for the rest of your life. Now, it is true that some people, a small percentage of people do go on to have a chronic telogen effluvium, chronically shedding all the time. But for the most part, it is temporary. Hair usually starts to regrow to get back into the growing phase several months down the line, once your body adapts. Third, if you are noticing pattern hair loss, pattern thinning, like you see more of your scalp, central scalp, receding hairline, you might actually have androgenetic alopecia. The medication, again, did not cause that. It just revealed it. It would have happened anyway. It was already happening. You just had a lot more hair in the growing phase to mask it. And androgenetic alopecia might need medical intervention to stabilize it. And I have a lot of videos on my channel about the different medical interventions that are offered, such as topical minoxidil, oral minoxidil, dutasteride, finasteride, spironolactone, low-level laser therapy, massage. I mean, I've got a lot of videos on treating androgenetic alopecia, including those popular natural remedies like castor oil and rosemary oil. The good news with regards to your weight loss journey is that the hair loss you might be experiencing is not a sign that you need to stop the medication. Most people can manage their metabolic health, their weight loss goals, stay on the medication, and maintain their hair health. Let's talk about what to do about this. People want to be proactive, take control of their health. Understandable. When it comes to hair health, make sure you and your doctor are staying on top of blood work. As your appetite is suppressed on these medications, maybe you're not getting quite the variety in your diet that you need to be. It is possible in this situation to run into issues with vitamin deficiencies. Maybe before getting on these medications, you weren't as optimized on certain nutrients that are really important for growing hair. These include B vitamins, zinc, biotin. So make sure that your nutrition is optimized. Also make sure you are getting the amount of protein recommended. Growing hair is an amino acid demanding task. So that's an important macronutrient to make sure that you are staying on top of. Also iron is really important
important as well. Aside from the micronutrients, the dietary factors, the other big one that can be off in people who struggle with their weight and are in the process of losing weight might actually be your thyroid. I kind of alluded to this early. Remember, people with thyroid disorder were excluded from the study looking at the effects of these medications on hair loss. But if you have an underlying thyroid problem that needs to be corrected, it will cause hair loss problems. I have a whole video, two videos, three videos, I think, on thyroid related hair loss issues. So watch those videos if you're someone who struggles with thyroid health. Track your hair changes. Take photographs every couple of months to document progress and changes. That way you can spot trends. It's easy to get in the depths of despair when it comes to hair loss and not appreciate the fact that your hair is actually turning a corner and you're getting some improvement because unfortunately hair growth, it is a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. If the hair shedding is uncovering androgenetic alopecia, talk to your doctor about medical interventions like minoxidil, low-level laser therapy. These can really help. Also, avoid tight hairstyles that put a lot of traction on the hair, can cause excessive breakage, and make the follicle inflamed and potentially scar down the road. Be really gentle with your hair care. Don't pursue harsh styling practices like uh, getting chemical processing, bleach. I even suggest pausing a lot of heat styling because that, in some cases, can contribute to hair shaft fragility and breakage, which is only going to make the hair loss even more distressing for you. If your shedding is severe and persists beyond the six month mark after it has started, definitely check in with your healthcare provider and see a board certified dermatologist. Because remember, hair loss is a huge category. Telogen effluvium and androgenetic alopecia are merely the tip of the hair loss iceberg. The last thing you want to do is sleep on an underlying hair loss disorder because when it comes to hair loss, knowing what you have is key so that it can be treated. Hair health is optimally maintained in the setting of hair loss when it is intervened on early on. Better chance of saving your hair long term if you get in there early in the process. Sometimes it can be too little too late. And in the case of scarring hair loss disorders, which we didn't cover in today's video, once the scar forms, there's no going back. There's no growing a hair out of that follicle. So don't sleep on hair loss. Let's look at some examples here so you get a sense of what you might expect if you are on these medications or thinking about going on them. Case number one, you have a woman in her 30s who starts semaglutide and loses about 20 pounds in the first three months. She starts noticing excessive hair shedding by about month two or three. Her lab work shows low iron. With the appropriate supplementation, gentle hair care, and correction of the underlying iron deficiency, the shedding improves over six months. Case number two, you have a 52-year-old man who starts Ozembic. He drops about 30 pounds. He starts noticing that his hairline is receding. Turns out he has male pattern hair loss. It's now become more obvious. He also experiences a lot of shedding. He starts topical minoxidil and the hair loss process stabilizes and he starts to get some regrowth. Remember, every case is different. No one individual is exactly a carbon copy of someone else, but these are just some examples to give you some idea of the natural trajectory this often goes. Let's go over some frequently asked questions. If I'm noticing hair loss, should I stop my GLP-1 medication? Not necessarily. Talk to your doctor. In many cases, the benefits of continuing the medication might not weigh the risks to your hair. Remember, we can often manage hair loss and in many cases it is temporary, not permanent. Is my hair gonna grow back? If it's telogen effluvium, in most cases, yes. The excessive shedding will come to a halt and those follicles will re-enter the growing phase and you'll go back to normal hair growth. However, if it's androgenetic alopecia, you might need medical intervention to halt the process. Is one GLP-1 medication worse than another in terms of causing hair loss? We don't know that yet, but the study we do have looked at several GLP-1 receptor agonist medications, and they didn't find any big differences among the different types. So to recap, GLP-1 receptor agonists like Wagovi and Ozempic might be associated with an increase in hair shedding. Most of this is likely due to weight loss, stress, or unmasking genetic thinning. The shedding is often temporary and treatable. If you're noticing hair loss, don't panic, but do check in with your healthcare provider with regards to your nutrition, lab work, and if necessary, they can refer you to a dermatologist for further evaluation. There's no need to abandon your treatment, but you do deserve support for both your weight loss goals and your hair. All right, guys, so that's what I wanted to talk about in today's video. Now, for those of you who are considering these medications, you probably have heard horror stories of Ozempic phase or these medications causing rapid facial aging. Maybe that is terrifying 
terrifying you. If that is the case, then you need to watch the video on the insulate where I go over this exact concern. I break down the science there in detail so you know what to expect. But if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.